Hello everyone, my name is Pim Huizenetveld and I'm a group leader here at the Max Pirots Lab since August 2023. In the lab we study chromosome segregation. That is the process when two copies of the genome are distributed over the arising daughter cells. That might sound like a simple task, but there is an enormous molecular complexity to it. And I find it fascinating to think about the proteins and the protein DNA interactions that make that go correctly all the time. And we learned a great deal about that in the last decade. But if you zoom in, there are still many details that we do not understand. Like, what are these proteins precisely? What do they do? We cannot quantify it. What do they do? Where do they do that? With whom do they do that? How do they do that? How quickly? And that's what we like to understand. In the lab, we take a biochemical reconstitution approach. That means we try to get all the relevant players, all the relevant biomolecules from recombinant material into a test tube and try then to in vitro investigate the properties of the system add components, mutate components, titrate components, and get quantitative and mechanistic insights. It's a little bit like cooking. It's like cooking when you have to first get all the ingredients together, and that might actually be part of the hard work. So we try to get the best proteins and protein DNA complexes, and then mix them together. Then we go to cook, and that's the fun part. And it's a little bit like then for cooking, if you have really good ingredients, sometimes you don't even need to do so much to make a good dish. In other words, make a good discovery. So yeah, that's in a nutshell our approach. The speed of discoveries in the life sciences is really groundbreaking. I look sometimes back at papers from the, let's say the 1990s and the amount of work that goes into like a paper at that time was probably the same, but the amount of information in there is completely different now. So what took years then took probably months, a couple of years back, and now we can do it probably in, 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 in days or maybe even in hours. So we can get so many new insights about the biomolecules in our body that it's really fascinating to think about what we can even accomplish in the future. So it's, uh, it's, it's thrilling to think about that, how much we will learn in the next 10 or 20 years and to be a part of that. That's quite exciting. As a, there's a story that as a child, I was wondering why I am right-handed and I'm left-footed. And it turns out my brother and some of my aunts and some of my uncles are also right-handed and left-footed. And then I was really curious to figure out how that works. How can you get such kind of uh, information across generations? But I might have been 10 years old or so. And uh, my dreams of becoming a neurobiologist then vanished for quite a few years. And only later in, during my studies of molecular life sciences, I became again passionate for doing science. And it was maybe not at the bachelor level, but rather later when I got my own research project, even if it was only for a few weeks or a few months and tried to really accomplish something and, and got the hang of it. And then thought that it would be fun to do that for longer and decided to go for a PhD and whatever came next, more and more research. There are many things I could imagine doing, and I could imagine them being fun to do. Um, designing board games, making something out of wood. But if I had to pick one thing, it would be improving cycling infrastructure worldwide. I think that's, being Dutch, I see that as a, as a, as a huge deficit everywhere. So cycling should be for people from 8 to 80, and it should be a fun activity and a safe activity. Children should be able to chat with each other while they cycle to school. And I think our ambitions are just way too low to try to get that into, uh, into our cities. What does it take to be a good scientist? Well, that's, uh, that's a tough question. There are probably many very different kinds of good scientists and, and, and paths that lead to success and who am I to judge? Um, but I can think of uh, people that were inspirational to me, um, for example, uh, Barbara McClintock was really thinking outside of the box and thinking ahead of her time from her uh, biography. It seems also really like a dedicated and persistent person that yeah, made, made fantastic discoveries. I'm also thinking about a quote that I attribute, maybe rightly so, maybe not, to Kim Naismith, who told about the weird mix that a scientist needs to have, the weird mix of being enthusiastic. So you see some kind of exciting result, and even if it's just a faint bend on a gel or some kind of slightest idea of a new, of a new hypothesis, you have to really be inspired and go for it and be enthusiastic. But at the same time, you have to be like most critical person about your own ideas. And you don't want to go out and celebrate something before you try really hard to falsify it in the sense of um, Karl Popper trying to generate ideas that can also be falsified in order to be uh, 
to be to be good ideas and to be as close as possible to getting a new insight into scientific uh, truth. Yeah, my name. So <laughs> uh, my name is very complicated. Pim Haus in het veld, which is Dutch for house in the field. So if you'd say Pim Haus in the field, it's actually not so bad. Maybe easier to remember. Um, if I could change anything, I would probably pick a synonym for doing science and publishing papers because having all these special characters, uh, apostrophe and, 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 and uh, a, a space within my last name causes all kinds of problems when indexing.